Um, all right. So, you know, when it comes down to it, putting people in charge of figuring out what the right controls are for their software, that kind of seems intuitively correct. And the reason why my organization got into DevSecOps is we were moving to that unfavorite word, the cloud. Um, and well, moving to the cloud means that you're giving a whole bunch of people responsibility for doing things that create software. So if you think about software as eating the world, like I always like to say when it comes to Mark Andreessen, um, framing that up, I, I think software ate the world. And now we're all kind of in that world where we might even go borrow things from each other. Anybody like to borrow software? Come on, all the hands should be going up. I even like to borrow software. But you know what I find is that, and it's really sad, um, we recently had a really cool thing that we were trying to do. It was just literally creating a little form page. And we borrowed a component part. And the reason why it comes up when you're looking at something like this is, borrowed a component part, thought, OK, this is pretty good. The uh, developer was actually pretty security wise. And we threw it up for, I don't know, a couple hours. And one of our internal hackers basically pwned the crap out of it. That's actually like a legit security phrase. Um, <laughs> and uh, and pwning the crap out of it, literally got onto the machine, took it over, uh, found a brand new RCE in that component part. And by the way, there was no CVE for it. There wasn't like a way to go scan it. It actually legit took somebody to go figure it out. And it wasn't because the developer was stupid, and it wasn't because anybody you know, had um, neglected their responsibilities for security. It was because that really obscure way to get in just wasn't conceived of. Like That person just legitimately didn't know that you could do the thing that that person did to their software. And so you kind of have this really interesting um, paradigm and conundrum that comes up. You know, who should be responsible for figuring out how software gets made safe? Um, so I like to think that this is the beginning of a revolution, not one that I think needs to overthrow all the great and talented work that's gone in um, to the many years that have gone into things that are regulatory compliance, but to extend it, to take it out there and make it better and part of everything that's happening. I also want to give a shout out to my favorite people, the OWASP clan. Um, without you, I don't think I would have been, been inspired to really think about software in a unique and different way. Um, the OWASP top 10 are not my favorite. You'll see if you ever go watch me talk about the OWASP top 10. Um, and the reason why is because I'm kind of an adversary scientist. Uh, I run adversary management effectively at my company. Uh, not just DevSecOps, not going out and just inspiring developers to add security to what they do, not just going out and red teaming and proving that people aren't doing their jobs, but actually looking at what adversaries do every day and, and figuring it out. So my talk starts off with hindsight is 2020. I thought that was kind of cool because 2020 is coming and, you know, well, hell. Uh, we might as well look back and see where we all did it wrong. Uh, security for, what is it, the past 50 years about hasn't quite been on the right path, do you think? Anybody feel like we've done it really well? Yeah. All right. Cool. Why not? So I did a bunch of scientific work. I always kind of do this. So by the way, during the day, I'm a director and manager of many, many people. And at night, I'm what you call a hobbyist scientist. Uh, that could be anything from I hack crap, because uh, that's fun, uh, to uh, actually looking at what's happening in the industry. I'm on a project right now, 5,000 companies, $350 billion of revenue for security. What the heck is going on? Uh, and so I'm I'm totally inspired by it because it's actually um, really eye-opening to see what's being invented, developed, and what's being sold to people. Do you know that a lot of people are actually buying multi-million dollar features? That's right, not just applications, not just products that are out there, but a feature can cost you multi-millions of dollars. That's kind of crazy, right? You're not going to solve anything if a feature is worth that much, because essentially what it means is we just have it wrong. But along the way, what I found was security people like perfection. Anybody in here, security person? I, th I thought I saw a few when I was putting my hand up. Yeah, we're the perfectionists, the control freaks, the 
junkies, you know. We like to go break stuff because we can. Um, I would say that there's never been a piece of software that hasn't been broken in my presence. Uh, I'm also pretty good at social engineering and pretty good at phishing. So if you ever get an email from me, I'm sorry. I might be uh, effectively working on you. All right. So that said, what is DevOps like? Well, they want to solve problems. They want to solve customer problems. And in my organization, we also create security software, and we solve customer problems. We solve our developers' problems, their internal customers, right? So that's kind of an interesting thought process. So where did it all go wrong? And the answer is 1976. That's when security lost. How do I know this? Well, there was this paper that was written um, by GE and the Air Force. And they wrote a paper on quality. And it actually had 55 attributes of quality. 55. That's right. Quality software has 55 attributes. And by the way, they thought that was too many. So they boiled it down to 11. And when they boiled it down to 11, safety became integrity, software integrity. If your software was not integral, apparently it was not safe either. And by leaving safety and in integrity, what essentially they did is they took this uh, thing that happens in the human brain and they converted you away from thinking that you would build something that was unsafe. Because integrity is a very different word than safety, right? If your software doesn't have integrity, do you think much of it? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on how important it really is. But if we were to say, hey, your software has no integrity, you might go, okay. I'll work on it. If we say that your software has no safety, you might think twice, right? So we lost in 1976. And that's a big damn deal. Because what's the year now? 2019, about to be 2020. I like to go back and look at when things go wrong because my belief is that if you go study the past, you won't actually recreate it. And so the idea behind DevSecOps wasn't to recreate yet another misstep, but it was actually to go back and look at how do we bring everybody together? How do we make software better? How do we pull all these things um, so that people can actually be successful at them? So if you think about it, you're a developer, you're now doing operations, you've got all these things. I just said 55 attributes of quality. If you're a software developer, I'm so sorry, that's a lot of stuff to have to remember and do well, which means there's a lot of opportunity out there when it comes to being a vendor. And at the same time, in 1976, when we all lost and we put safety and integrity, well, guess what? That meant that the vendor space actually started much later. Do you know that it wasn't until the late 1980s that we started to see the first problems of, that's right, safety problems with software? We saw the invent of firewalls as an example. Anybody know why the first firewall was invented? Yeah, it was so that we could create tickets, exactly, so we could make developers' lives miserable, absolutely. There was nothing out there that we had to stop or prevent. It wasn't like there were adversaries trying to go and get into your systems for no good reason. Passwords weren't effective even then. Um, and if you think about it, no one wants to be the father of the firewall. If you go look online, you'll actually find it amusing. Go find the uh, father of the firewall. And I didn't say mother of the firewall. I said father of the firewall. And by the way, they're all pointing fingers at each other because nobody wants to take responsibility for having done that. And I'm really excited if they decide to take me up on standing on stage with me and saying, I am the father of the firewall because I just think that it was an amazing thing that they did. But I also think that it started the problem space. Like, they didn't say, you know what? We lost in 1976 when they invented the firewall. They bolted firewalls onto what we do. And they created the beginning of the paradigm of we're going to just add security into software one little feature at a time. Billions of dollars later, we are paying for features for security one billion dollars at a time. So 2019, I just said I'm studying 5,000 companies, $350 billion in security revenue. $350 billion, right? Everybody 
whoa. Uh, somebody said it was worth $230 billion. I was reading, uh, I always do this, I kind of go out and look for uh, university papers, master's thesis, doctoral theses, read them, and there's all kinds of cool ones. I found one from Wharton that's actually very interesting. And in 2019, they think it's worth $230 billion, but I actually found $350 billion. And you know, it's really hard to find security revenue dollars. And the reason why is because there's very few IPOs in this space. Isn't that kind of interesting? Why is that if at this point in time we're actually seeing more and more security problems? That's kind of an interesting thing. So what does that all turn out to be? What is $600 billion, right? That is the current security problem that we know about. This is if you report your breach. This is if you tell somebody there's a problem with security. This is if you are experiencing security outages or you can actually attribute a customer problem to security it is $600 billion. My belief is it's more. My belief is that people actually don't report their security problems. So you're a bunch of software developers in the room. Let's just kind of play this way, whether you are or you're not, right? Do you go looking for adversaries? Are you hunting them down in your logs? Maybe you left them out. When you designed your software, did you think about the adversary? Who does threat models? Who does attack maps? You know what an attack map is? If I gave you a blank piece of paper and I said, go attack your software, you don't need to know anything other than just tell me the list of ways that I would break into your stuff, that I actually have a better chance of getting information out of you and having you think differently about your software than to do a threat model. We did a bunch of experiments on this. A blank piece of paper will get me many more ways that you'll actually tell me that you cut corners. Like I said, I borrowed a component part so we wouldn't have to write something. That was amazing. We did a ton of security work on that component part, and the unforeseen happened. We weren't perfect. We weren't able to do everything we were supposed to do. And it's a $600 billion problem. Why did we lose? Well. If there were 55 attributes, I like to study a few of them. One of the ones that I really find fabulous is availability. I'm into nines. I like five nines because I'm a perfectionist. Remember I told you we're all control freaks at security, so five nines sounds amazing. I like 100% because, you know, A students, right? Um, I would say that most security professionals, <laughs> they're probably in the A student category, or they were like not that interested in school, and so they actually just realized that they could make a living without going to school, which means they're still kind of an A student because they really focused on perfection. Um, but let's play this out. Availability, which was kept in in 1976, is a $4.5 billion problem today. That's right. It's less than 1% of what we're seeing in the security industry. $600 billion versus $4.5 billion. This is actually off of an IBM study. They're usually right so I tend to like their numbers. Um, by the way, finding really good numbers in the security industry that actually have lots of data with them, they're really hard to find and it's because people don't share. You're a DevSecOps person now. I actually like to share. Here's my threat intel. Here's what the adversaries are doing. Why are they doing it? Let's get scientific about it, right? Well, in availability, most people are pretty scientific. They share hey, by the way, don't do this, and here's why, because you'll actually have an outage for many days. Instead, here's the best practices. How often do you have con conversations with a security practitioner where it doesn't land, land in, hey, that was really stupid? Right? Anybody? I can tell you it's really hard to have those conversations. I see it all too often. So bang your head here. Where the heck are we going to go? I mean, we lost, right? Throw in the towel. Hey, by the way, you're all running scanners now, right? Because DevSecOps, it's all about the pipeline. I've seen all these slides, and I've seen many, many talks about the pipeline and how if we can just scan everything before it goes out, we won't have left it out. How many people are scanning in line, in their pipeline, right? And you're using you know, scanners you created? Or you're using commercial scanners? Raise your hands if you're using commercial scanners. Probably all the same people. Yep, yep, yep. 1%. There's a whole bunch of studies that have been done on all those scanners over the years. They find 1% of the problem. 1%. What about the other 99% that come out? Are you blocking your pipelines? You probably are. Block it for the 1%. Because the rest of it 
It's hygiene, yes. It's going to take somebody who's really interested. Because, by the way, most of your scanners, they live off of CVE. Has anybody studied CVE over the years? It's declining, like really rapidly declining. Why is that? Bug bounties, paying for features, paying for CVEs. Um, it's an interesting thing to watch security, and it's an interesting thing to study it because that means that everybody in the room who's got software out there, you actually need to write your own unit tests. You need to write your own adversary tests. It means you actually have to design with adversaries in mind. So I say that we lost because we didn't have securability. Uh, you know, you got to invent a word. I like to invent words. Heck, right? Yeah, hey. Um, I'm a provocateur, so that means that I might as well like put more words out there. Um, and it's actually designed to help you understand that if we had had an illity that was called security something, by the way, security is not actually an illity itself. It's like a state of being. It's either secure or it's not according to many that I usually interface with. Um, but securability, the ability to secure something. What if I told you that you need to build your software as secure as the adversaries that are interested in it? Would you care about the adversaries that are interested in it? How many people build software that might be susceptible to, I don't know, um, account takeover? Anybody? Yeah? All right. Awesome. Anybody writing software that actually might be susceptible to phishing? Yeah? By the way, if you don't know, this is a great time for you to start thinking about it. What about, what about your software being used for things like money laundering or uh, credit card processing or any of those things? Are you thinking about those things at the time you design it? It's important to. So, you know, the black cat, because by the way, security, we like to bring cats to the world. Um, this one follows me around conference to conference because, oh no, you did not just invent another word, lady. What the heck is wrong with you? Um, I like to say that if I'm going to get anybody to change what they're doing, securability should have been basically baked in a long time ago. So it would have made $600 billion go away. We probably would have about a 1% problem, which means it would be about $6 billion today. That's a huge reduction. 99% of the world's securability problems would have gone away by now because they had the same amount of time as everything else. And oh, by the way, measurement requirements, we wouldn't be fighting about this. They would actually just be here. Developers and security and ops would be all favorable towards the fact that we have common, actionable metrics for everything, including security. Anybody got any actionable security metrics that they can tout besides something I'm about to throw up here? Come on, you know. You know if they're actionable too, by the way, because somebody actually looks at them and they can do something about it. You look at a security problem, do you know you can do something about it? I want to talk to you at the end because you seem like you know a lot of stuff. You keep raising your hand. So we should definitely chat. Um, but I'm going to tell you, when it comes down to it, if you're not measuring something, you're not doing it. And uh, so securability is basically one minus exploitability. That means essentially that you're actually finding the exploits in your code. This is not theatrics, by the way. If if somebody's not breaking into your code, you or somebody else, then an adversary actually might be. Do you know how many exploitable opportunities? Anybody know of any software out there that actually will tell you how many exploitable opportunities are in your software? That's not a scanner, right? Well, I need to talk to you then, too. Um, exploitable opportunities, that's all the resources. That's basically your bill of materials, your software bill of materials multiplied by all the exploitable opportunities there are, meaning exploits, uh, whether it be things that you actually have to take that are POCs, proofs of concept and exploit land, means you actually have to make them better to exploit your code. We invest a lot in doing that. Um, I don't know of a lot of other companies that do, but I would invite you to, because by the way, it would be great for an ability to create an exchange between companies. So what if you were looking at something like this? When did you have a problem? You had a problem in May. Is it obvious? Is it potentially, if, there, if you were able to click on this, would it be actionable? Potentially. It would tell you exactly where you had the problem. It would make it so that you realize that just like availability, you got the design wrong. And that means that you have the ability to get ahead on the design. And since hindsight is 2020, essentially you've got to have a metric. 
I also think I made fun of um, security a while back and I created this security facts label because while well, I was dieting at the time and I'm a dieting again, so I'm still looking at these facts labels. And I gotta tell you, it's amazing to look at them. And the reason why is because the primary ingredient, just like when you're looking at things like how much fat is in this stuff, how much adversary interest do you really have? Anybody got you know a rasp for their web app? That'll tell you every day, all day long. It'll be like, yep, you got scanned, you got scanned again, you got scanned again, you got scanned again. Oh, by the way, there's somebody who's fiddling with all of your applications. Oh, by the way, it's actually coming from this IP address in some other country, and that's a good starter for your threat intel, so that's really cool. You'd have the ability to look into your software and say, you know what, 80% of the things that are out there for security, they could be done with a hierarchy of needs. That would have happened. You'd have your software basically able to leverage five key areas and principles against adversaries. It would be baked into your thinking and your thought process. And my favorite of all time, your CI CD pipeline. You know that part where you're DevOpsing your code, you're creating value. I like value mapping because basically the security side of it is value degradation. I'm still trying to help people understand that you don't value map in security, you value degrade. That's great, you have all these features that create things and I have all these breaking capabilities that break things. So you match them together and actually your value creation is minus your value degradation, that's actually the value you create. And when it comes down to it, this pipeline is super cool and you're probably putting all kinds of stuff into your pipeline. I remember back in the days of SSDLC and they didn't actually have a CI CD pipeline. We were always like as security professionals going, okay, where does static code analysis go? We gotta get them to do it, right? You remember like those really hungry security people. And all of a sudden it becomes really obvious and, and interesting. You just basically realize that all of these are features that are missing in the CI CD pipeline. What if your CI CD pipeline came with a source code version repository that did code analysis for you and helped you make better decisions? What if when you build your software, you have dependency checking that basically already tells you you're not doing it quite right? That's what we're all striving for when I see the DevOps pipeline capabilities that now include security. But the truth is, is that a lot of the products that are out there, they don't actually match up to what you need in your software because we aren't holding them to a securability number yet. What if you were to hold those scanners up and say, how much securability do you give me? How much do you return to me? And where do you return the most to me? And what if you were to try those things, right? What if you were to basically say, hey, by the way, your security feature and product set only gives me 0.01 securability, so this is how much I'm gonna pay you. What if? So what if, in hindsight, we could have eradicated most breaches what if we could make software safer? What if all those safety critical systems actually had us thinking about security from the design all the way through? And even the vendors that we have out there that could be creating even better security features, what if they were? What if adversaries didn't have an advantage? And by the way, getting started now means that adversaries that do have an advantage, they're gonna fight harder. They're gonna play difficult. They're going to make it really challenging for us. But it doesn't mean we should leave it by the wayside. It means we have a fighting chance if we start measuring it, eyes wide open, going in, and basically making changes. So I wanna inspire all of you to be part of the solution of bringing things like this to life. And I'm working on a book with Ernest Mueller and James Wickett and John Willis to do DevSecOps as a handbook. And it's not just about a pipeline, it is truly about changing how software comes together. And like I said to you, I started this as a story about rugged software. Your software needs to be rugged because even if you're putting cat pictures on the internet, um, well, guess what? 
that could actually disrupt a safety critical system because they could be pivoting from your system to somewhere else. And so I would say everything on the internet needs to be secured because that's actually how you get it to be a safe environment for all the apps that are out there. So thank you so much today for coming. This is an amazing turnout for the first DevSecOps Days Austin. And uh, you're always one of my favorite crews out there. I love coming to see you guys. Let's, let's definitely change this and get things off to the good start. Bye for now. All right, thank you very much, Shannon.